Right, this session, uh, we can kick off. This session is climate and the environment and the themes of climate change, ecology, biodiversity and the Green New Deal. Our first presenter is Anne Pettifer. You all know Anne Pettifer, anyway. Anne Pettifer, British economist who advises governments and organisations, work focused on the global financial system, sovereign debt, restructuring international finance, sustainable development, She's perhaps the best known for correctly predicting the financial crisis 2007-2008. She'll give you betting tips later. She was one of the leaders of Jubilee 2000 debt campaign. Most of you will remember it, how successful that was. Director of Policy and Research in Macroeconomics for Prime. Network, it's a network of economists and a member of the Green New Deal group of economists, environmentalists and entrepreneurs. And as Mary and others will tell you, was really instrumental in advising us on the Green New Deal and our policies around the environment overall for the last couple of manifestos and since then in various campaigns. Over to you, Anne. Thank you very much. So, uh, first of all, thank you to John and to Madeline for organising this and bringing us all together. Got a is it needed? And I can tell from the people here that we're all thirsty, hungry for getting together and talking about these things. Now, I, um, I managed to corrupt some of my, um, my slides, uh, but anyway, I'm going to start here. I want to start here, and I heard what Mary said this morning about how conditions are different now, and I want to stress, and I want to start here with Versailles, and just remind you how bad conditions were then. As we just recovered, we just ended an imperialist war. People across Europe were starving because of blockades and because of the end of the war. There was riots and there were um, strikes all around. This is the Palace of Versailles where the negotiations were taking place. And on this day, there was a massive uh, strike of French workers. So the place was in total upheaval um, and had been, you know, large swathes of Europe had been destroyed and had to be rebuilt. And here were these world leaders gathered in this posh place trying to solve the problem. And John Maynard Keynes was there as well. Now, I have to say, because I say this in every talk I give, that Keynes is wrongly defined as being uh, the inventor, if you like, of tax and spend, of fiscal policy. Um, to be anti-austerity is to be Keynesian. This is not what Keynes was about. Keynes was deeply uninterested in fiscal policy. He was passionately concerned with monetary and financial policy, and he regarded fiscal policy as a consequence of a stable or unstable or broken financial system. And so you had to focus on fixing the financial system if you wanted to fix the, de the deficit. So, you know, I just want to say this because both his enemies and his friends have dubbed him tax and spend, and we must get out of that. And I want to talk about what the proposal he made in 1919 for the rehabilitation of European credit and for financing relief and reconstruction. I'm South African born, and a good friend of his at this time was Jan Smuts. What's wrong with Jan Smuts? But Jan Smuts toured Europe and kept coming back to him and telling him how people were starving and how awful and degraded uh, the European economy was. So he came up with a scheme for rehabilitating Europe. And that, and I'm telling you this because that's where the Green New Deal originated, in 1919, not in 1933 or 45. So the key thing about his plan was that he was committed to redesigning the international financial architecture. He said we had to do that first and foremost. We had to depart from what was then called the gold standard, which was really government by Wall Street, government by the City of London or government by Wall Street. He said we had to end that and we had to move to government, if you like, by public authorities, democratically elected public authorities. We had to exercise public authority over the financial system, which at that time was governed by private authority. So he made this revolutionary plan, and I'm calling it revolutionary, because if it had been implemented, we would not have had a Second World War. We would not have had the rise of fascism. We would not have had the catastrophe that was the 20s and the 30s. 
And, um, it, of course, I'll, I'll explain a bit more about it. So his plan was a simple one. Germany would issue a bond. I promised to pay, right? That bond would need to raise one billion pounds, which in 1919 was quite a lot of money. That bond, the repayment of that bond by Germany, would have priority over the repayment of all other bonds. That means that that bond would, would have priority over Wall Street debt. Now, you need to remember that Wall Street had financed both sides of the First World War and had built up massive debts, had issued bonds on private bonds, and he, Keynes was saying, well, those bonds are going to be subordinated to this bond. And enemy nations, the only thing they would have to do is not to go around collecting savings or taxes or whatever to finance this. All they would have to do would be to guarantee the bond. In other words, if Germany defaulted, then France, Britain, and the United States would repay, right? That's all they had to do, just make the promise, the guarantee. Um, the bonds would be acceptable, he argued, as payment between allied governments and as first-class collateral at central banks. So the French could use the bonds to pay debts to the British because there was this problem of inter-allied debt as well. And his, his plan included provisions for other central powers and new nations to issue similar bonds, similarly secured by guarantees by the big, powerful economies. Unfortunately for Keynes, and he was rather naive politically, unfortunately for him, uh, the advisor to President Wilson, the most powerful leader at the Versailles Conference, was this man called Thomas Lamont. And his nephew subsequently wrote a biography of him and called him the ambassador from Wall Street. And Thomas Lamont read Keynes's proposal and said, over our dead bodies do public debts take precedence over Wall Street debts. And he persuades uh, Wilson to, um, to blow this up, uh, whereas the French and the British governments thought it was a very good idea. So the plan gets defeated, and Keynes goes home and he writes this vitriolic book, The Economic Consequences of the Peace, in which he personally, and in my view quite rudely, attacks all the leaders. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the best-selling economics tech book around. It's still, in public, it's still being published. It's extraordinary. But he was so angry at the way his plan had been defeated. Now, that is the basis of the Green New Deal. And it becomes later the basis of the New Deal. So what's happening in England at this time? In England under this time, we have Ramsay MacDonald in 1929-31, 10 years later, and Philip Snowden, rigid exponents of orthodox finance who would not permit investment and spending to stimulate the economy. With unemployment at 2 million after the 29 crash, they struggle to balance the budget to maintain sterling on the gold standard. So everything that the, the government, the Labour government at that time, 2931, wanted to do was subject to the permission of Wall Street. Let's not miss around. The city of London was small beer compared to Wall Street. If Wall Street didn't like it, you couldn't do it. And so what they were trying to do was to implement policy that would be acceptable to Wall Street. And that meant austerity. And, and that's, in, that, in August 1931, Ramsay MacDonald formed the national government to carry out spending cuts to defend the gold standard. And of course, he destroys the Labour Party in the process, or the Labour Party's power in government. But then something happens. It's really quite interesting. How many people here have heard of the mutiny the Invergordon Mutiny. Ah, what wonderful. This is an amazing thing. On the morning of Tuesday, the 15th of September, 1931, the Cromarty Firth rang to cheers from the Royal Navy ships lying off Invergordon. This wasn't an outbreak of patriotic, patriotic fervour, but the sound, sound of thousands of sailors coming out on strike. It's called a mutiny, but it's more accurate to call it an industrial dispute carried out by servicemen who were supposed to have left 
their civilian rights at the gangplank. Right. So this this is when you know Macdonald announces cuts to pay, sailors' pay, and the sailors say, well, if you're going to cut our pay, we're not going to board the ship. They literally bring the whole of the British Navy to a halt. Right? They just simply defy their bosses and refuse to board ships into sail. This is a massive mutiny, which very few people know about, actually, where the whole of the, the Royal Navy is paralysed by this uh, industrial dispute. This leads to a stock market panic, because the stock market, basically, the finance sector thinks that McDonald's not going to be able to implement austerity. There's then a run on the pound. International speculators think, oh, we're not going to stick here because we may find that public spending takes priority over private spending, in particular private repayment of debts to us. And so they have a run. Britain is forced off the gold standard. It was incredibly humiliating. Britain, which was the, the, the world's greatest advocate of the gold standard, was forced off it. Now, what I want to say, why I want to say this to you, is there's like a lightning strike between the sailors' pay cuts, the mutiny, the stock market panic, the run on the pound, and the collapse for Britain of its membership of this international financial uh, framework. Um, it's devastating. The Daily Herald, whose sales skyrocketed during this period, described the national government as a dictatorship of international finance. The price of saving the pound, it argued, is to be paid by the very poorest people of this country. And the reason I'm telling you this story is that I'm, I'm so concerned that the left focuses on austerity, which is bad, and, and all of that, but never really fully makes the connections between austerity, monetary system, and the international financial system, and the fact that it's governed by private authority. Right? And if we don't make those connections, we're going to go on and on, digging the hole. The, the austerity hole will just get deeper and deeper, as it has done over, uh, over decades. And we can see the history of the Labour Party, where the Labour Party in the 1920s and 1930s is devoted to this system, which priorities private finance. And then in 1933, something happens. Uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt is elected president. And in his inaugural address, he says, the money changes, this is after 29, the crisis of that, the collapse effectively of Wall Street. The money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization. We may now restore that temple to the ancient truths. The measure of the restoration lies to, in the extent to which we apply social values more noble than mere monetary profit. So he immediately, on that night, the night of his inauguration, he says to his staff, we are getting off the gold standard. I, I've been hearing what Keynes has said. I've read all of Keynes. He, he was, of course, he was governor of New York in 1929 when 5,000 banks went bust, right? He was also, he had been trained in economics. He said, we're getting off the gold standard and I want you tonight to go to Wall Street and tell them, you know, to freeze gold. And they said, well, you can't do it tonight because tomorrow is a holy day, Sunday. You're going to have to wait till Monday. So on Monday, he closes the bank. But he doesn't close them to fix the banks. He closes them in order to take the gold out of the banks. And then he goes public and he says to the public, hand over your gold. And to his astonishment, the public hand over their gold, right? The gold gets shifted into the treasuries, to the vaults of the treasury, away from Wall Street. And he gets a grip finally on managing the currency. Not just managing the currency, managing interest rates. He uh, appoints a progressive um, governor to the Federal Reserve, so they manage interest rates, so they manage the monetary system, they manage the currency, and then he can begin to spend. <coughs> and he begins to spend. <coughs> and I just want to say that that is some, a lesson we really just have to understand. That is the way we get transformation. Now, I have to say... You know, I've heard what was said this morning about grassroots activity, and now I'm there. You know, I was part of a mobilisation 
of millions of people worldwide to get the debts of 35 of the world's poorest countries cancelled by the year 2000. And we've got about $100 billion of debt written off in nominal terms. And so I know about mobilisation and grassroots mobilisation, right? And I know how transformative it could be. But first of all, and the, get, the key thing about Jubilee 2000 was that we explained to people how the system worked, how the system of international credits and creditors and sovereign debtors worked, where the power lay, what the resolution process was or wasn't, right? And people said, when I started working on that, I remember Oxfam saying, you can't do this. It's much too complicated. You can't explain it to the people in the street because, you know, it's the international financial system. And I said, that's bullshit, right? It's not rocket science. <laughs> And sure enough, people got it, and we brought about a huge change. So by dismantling the gold standard, Roosevelt placed a democratic government, not Wall Street, in the driving seat of the economy. I wanted to get an image of him driving, but of course he was disabled, so he couldn't drive. But this is a, an image of him sitting in a car, at least. It enabled the Roosevelt administration to manage the value of the currency, the dollar, as well as cross-border capital flows, interest rates, and fiscal policy. In July 1933, Mr. Ramsey MacDonald organised was part of a conference held here in London called the World Economic Conference, called by the League of Nations. The purpose of that in 1933, July, after Roosevelt had been elected, was to restore the gold standard. And Ramsey MacDonald was at the helm of this thing, he wanted to see the gold standard restored because his administration had been humiliated by having to be kicked out of it by a bunch of sailors. So, um, so Roosevelt writes a letter to them. And it's called the Bombshell Letter. And in it he says, the old fetishes of so-called international bankers are old and we must abandon them. And we must have the power to manage our, our own currencies, right? and so on. It's, it's called a bombshell. It closes down the conference. This is a conference of world bankers who want to restore the system of private authority over the financial system. And he blows it up just by refusing to attend as president of the most powerful nation. So, he begins to spend. He sets up the Works Progress Administration. When I say he, his administration begins to spend. They, it's an amazingly progressive period, you know. They had societies for women painters. They, had, they promoted the arts. Um, John Steinbeck's famous book, The Grapes of Wrath, was financed by Roosevelt, by Roosevelt's program of supporting, financially supporting artists, right? Music, culture, all of that was incredibly important. They um, set up works projects all over the place, they introduced um, security for the family, um, social security. Um, but most importantly, from our perspective, is they invested in transforming the Dust Bowl, the ecological crisis of 1933, by planting at least four billion trees. <coughs> and that was extraordinary. They had to do this because whole swathes of the United States had been degraded by over-farming and over-exploitation over of the land. Now... I want to say this, Roosevelt was no angel. His policies were racist in many respects. He was married to a feminist, but he refused to have women as part of his civic organizations that planted the trees. Women had to, to look after their place in the home, etc., etc. So the man is no angel. And I'm not here to defend what, all of the things that were done wrong to satisfy the Southern Democrats who are all racists, of course. But I'm here to say that this, what he did here, is something that we must learn from. And that is, and it's the basis there. It was the reason why I joined the Green New Deal group, made up of environmentalists, ecologists who knew much more about the environment than I did. But I was very clear that what we had to do was to spend a whole lot of money transforming our way from our economy away from its addiction to fossil fuels. Where were we going to get the money from? And that's why I thought we couldn't talk about a new deal, a green new deal, without talking about the financing. How to manage the spigot that drives the hyper-globalization juggernaut 
by shifting power over the system from private to public authority. It needs to be a globally coordinated strategy, a reflation strategy worldwide. I'm very clear about that. I'm an African. I'm very clear about how Africa is ca carved out of all these things and how um, desperately they need to be, have their economies transformed as do the rest of the world. And the Trade and Development Report have shown us on how to undertake the structural transformation and this development-based recovery. But the most important thing for me is this. <coughs> We've got to begin to manage <coughs> public capital mobility. The power that Wall Street has, the City of London has, the private equity firms have, that asset managers have, they derive entirely from the, their ability to just move money where they fancy. And the, the, the impact of this on people is catastrophic, right? We just must not underestimate it. And I want to tell you the story of why it's catastrophic now. Because our energy prices and food prices are going through the roof not because of the simplistic notion of supply and demand, not because the Russians have cut off supplies, because actually when, you come, when it comes down to it, as we have learned from Germany, we don't need to depend on Russia's supply of oil, right? mainly because the Americans have upped their supply. That's not a good thing. But the fact of the matter is we can get by. We've got enough. Supply and demand is not fixing these prices. What's force prices to go through the roof is speculation, commodity speculation. And I tell the story in this way. Elon Musk, who's a bad guy, <laughs> another white South African, Elon Musk can fix the price of Tesla cars anywhere in the world, in New York, in London, and in China. He determines the price. President Putin does not fix the price of oil. So the Saudis do not fix the price of oil. Big, bad, BP, Exxon, Mobil, you name them, they do not fix the price of oil. Oh. They are all victims of the commodity markets, which are speculative markets, based in Chicago in particular, at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. Right? You have to feel sorry for BP. <laughs> this, <laughs> this, year, this year they made profits of how many... 90 billion, but in 2020 they lost 79 billion dollars of losses. Yeah, no, I love the, you know, shed a tear. But the fact of the matter is, and of course they don't, they're not entirely passive. They have groups inside their businesses who are also playing the market, the commodity market. So that they, they're not entirely crippled by this, but they can't do, they can't control that market. Who controls that market? The invisible hand. <laughs> and why, do, why is it so effective in forcing up prices? Well, because as soon as there's the smell of war, as soon as there's the tiniest indicator that there might be some disruption, hundreds of billions of dollars flood towards Chicago, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and gamble on whether the price is going to go up or whether it's going to go down, and when it's going to go up and when it's going to go down. They're gambling right now on, on the direction into which it will travel. And do you know what? We have absolutely no control over that market. So our Bank of England governor says <coughs> we've got inflation. Why? <laughs> because massive demand. Because people have got high wages and they're spending that money. And they're going out there and there's massive demand, as Osman was telling us, huge demand, and that's causing inflation. So what do we do? We raise interest rates and we kill demand back home. And the speculators think, well, that's nice. You know, I'm sitting out here, nobody comes near me. <laughs> nobody comes near those billions of dollars. Of course, the Fed is doing the same, the ECB is doing the same. It's catastrophic. It's really damaging. And they're all hoping that it doesn't turn into a great financial crisis, but I can tell you that is wishful thinking. So we need to manage, and I don't like to use the word capital controls. I like to think of myself as Ed Cook, the boss of Apple. Would you just let your company be run by the invisible hand? No. 
So if you're the prime minister of whatever, you want to be able to manage things in your domain, and that requires managing capital mobility. So it's very important governments must manage capital mobility in order to manage interest rates. If I can borrow money over there in Brazil or in South Africa for 8%, but in London it's only 1%, my money is going to go to Brazil. And then if Brazil has a crisis or lowers her rates, my money will flow out and go somewhere else. So Brazil can't fix interest rates um, and Britain can't fix interest rates because when capital is mobile, because the capital will just go. So when you're trying to keep interest rates low here to pay for investment, private and public, then the money will just escape and go to Brazil or wherever. And so we've got to be able to manage interest rates to manage capital mobility. And we've got to manage access to central bank resources. Now, Gordon Brown and Ed Boards would like us to believe that the Bank of England is independent. And nothing could be further from the truth. Right? Andrew Bailey is a political appointment. He got an appointment because he's a Brexiteer. Let's not beat about the bush, right? And I'm not objecting to political appointments. That's the right of a democratic government. But don't tell me he's independent, because that's rubbish, right? But it's also not true that he's independent in the sense of caring about Britain as a whole. He looks after the 1%. And the 1% want nothing more than to have access to quantitative easing. They want nothing more than to be able to buy the safe asset that is British government debt to use as collateral so they can have that collateral and then leverage additional borrowing against it on the sense they have got the safe collateral. They don't want to be invested in BP because BP could go bust. They don't want Mr. Adani in India because he can be fraudulent and you know his business could go to hell tomorrow. No, they want British government debt. Now, we should be able to say, as a democratic government, well, you can have access to British government debt. You can use it as collateral for your asset management fund, but these are the terms and conditions. Thou shalt pay thy taxes. <laughs> thou shalt keep thy money here. Thou shalt invest in Britain. If you don't want to do that, honey, you can't have access to these resources. I think we've just got to learn to say that. We don't even know that we have to say that. We don't even know we have the potential power to do it. We think it's an independent private body, the Bank of England. So we want to particularly to manage access to public safe assets. And we, we want the central bank to green collateral frameworks, which is what people like Daniela Gabor and so on are working on now, saying, if you're a fossil fuel company, you can't be messing with our, with our you can't have British safe assets, right? So, you know, there are ways in which we could, we could make, bring about change. We could really make it, give the, the big oil companies a hard time uh, by demanding that they change their collateral frameworks. So I want to end, because I'm sure I've gone on for too long already, by saying how do we pay for the Green New Deal? And I'm not going to be able to go into great detail, but I just, because I want to think about it conceptually, and I want us all to think about it conceptually. There's only two sources of income. The first source is credit, and the second source is savings. And what I want to explain, because I really don't think it's properly understood, I heard this morning, and I won't say who said it, that actually we have to raise taxes in order to pay for public services. And that is bullshit. It really is, right? We don't have to raise... Taxes are a consequence of investment and economic activity. They happen after we've spent the money. And it's like, you know, if you think about in your own job, you start a new job, you go to work, you work hard all month, at the end of the month you get paid. And then you get taxed. So your tax is a consequence of your employment, and, and I don't know who paid for you to get the job, but they would probably have borrowed money for that purpose in the first place, right? But the tax is a consequence of income. If you don't have income, tax revenues fall. If you don't have private income or public income, tax revenues fall and your budget gets out of balance. If you want to balance your budget, 
raise incomes everywhere and then balance but uh, uh, and that will bring in tax revenues and budgets will balance. So they're the consequence of credit finance, public and private investment, in particular in employment. So, you know, you could spend money on interest rate, paying off interest, and that's not productive. But if you spend money creating jobs, and this is why it's so important to the labour movement, because a green economy has to be a labour-intensive economy where we use human labour and not fossil fuel energy. Right? We've got to ride our own bicycles, we've got to walk, we've got to grow our own vegetables. There's going to be a lot more that we're going to have to do with manual labour. That's going to make it a full employment, labour-intensive economy. And the thing about in the labour-intensive economy is that people who are employed, people who are paid decent wages, high wages, people who are skilled, <coughs> generate the tax revenues that are needed to balance the budget. It doesn't work in a different, it doesn't, you know, you don't first get the tax revenue and then employ people. It works the other way around. In a monetary economy, all savings originate as credit. If you lived in a, a country with a barter economy or if you worked in a country in Africa where their monetary system is if not, uh, it's probably un not operational or um, doesn't have credibility, then you, then you have to go abroad for savings. You have to ask the Americans for dollars or the Japanese for yen or the Brits for sterling because you, you can't do it. But in a monetary economy, in a developed monetary economy, all saving originates as credit. With the development of monetary systems, society is no longer dependent on those with savings or surpluses for finance or credit. And that's the wonder of it. You know, in the old days, before we had, for example, before 1694, and we had a central bank, if you wanted to invest in your little plot of land, if you wanted to grow an extra harvest or some such, uh, an extra, yeah, harvest an extra piece of land, you'd have to go to the, the baron, the big bad baron, ask him if he could have some of his profit surpluses savings. And he would say, yeah, well, these are my terms and conditions. Very high rates of interest. You've got to repay me with your harvest for the next 15 years or whatever. And by the way, I see you've got a beautiful daughter. Bring her up to the castle. So, you know, in those days, that's what you were dependent on. And then we developed a monetary system, a central bank and a banking system. And you just went to the bank manager and you said, look, if I grow an extra harvest, I have extra income and I'll be able to repay this loan. And you get the mortgage, Right. So we do have to appreciate we work within a monetary system. Those with accumulated capital are no longer so provided as a finance. We don't have to rely on capitalists to tackle the climate crisis and, and, and ecosystem breakdown. In a monetary economy, savings are not needed for investment. The central bank provides credit at the macro level, if you like, to banks and other institutions, and private banks provide credit at the micro level of the economy. At the individual level, credit is something we fund expenditure by paying from future income. And at the level of the state, it is financing current spending investment from the state's future income, repaying ourselves. And we can see how much money there is, right? And when people say to you, there isn't any money, Please, you know, just remind them how the trillions of dollars, is $900 billion on the Bank of England's asset sheets alone, uh, balance sheets alone to, of assets. For, the t for, the, for all the central banks, it's in the region of $30 trillion, right? That's the credit that's available. That's the ability to create credit. They're, 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 they're called assets because they've issued loans, credit, and they're going to expect to get income from it in the future. That's why they're called assets. And they've issued $30 trillion worth of those. Now, the question is whether they will be repaid, but that's another story. But then we come to the question of pensions. Are there savings? I mean, the uh, question of savings. Are there enough savings in the world? Yes, there are. We know, according to the OECD, that there's $60, $60 trillion of savings in pension funds, right? Where's that money going? Well, quite a lot of it's going to Chicago. 
And you think about your pensions when you think about your pension fund investing in commodity speculation. You need to worry, right? What it should be doing is going into productive employment generating activity in, at home which generates income and tax revenues and keeps the system, not just the financial system, but also the public financial system, in balance. So, you know, we know we've got $60 trillion out there which is looking for safe investment. So, to conclude, <laughs> there's no shortage of finance for the Green New Deal. But the real shortage is of projects and plans for employment that will generate income, including tax revenues, to balance budgets and transform the economy and the ecosystem. <coughs> and I'll end on that note. Thank you. Thanks, uh, <coughs> thanks, uh, our, next <laughs> our next presenter is Dr. Kai Heron. He joined Burbeck's Department of Politics in November 2021. He writes, teaches, and researches at the intersection of contemporary political theory, global political economy, and critical geography, with a focus on land struggles, climate struggles, and ecologically regenerative futures. He's an associate of the progressive think tank Commonwealth, which most of you will be aware of, and associate editor at Contention Journal. Kai. Thank you. I don't have slides, so I'm going to leave this up as a promotional material for Adam's work. Um, okay, so thank you everyone for being here. Thank you um, for the conversations we've had so far. They've been really enlightening. I've been here since um, this morning listening along. And thank you, obviously, to John McDonnell and the rest of the organizers for setting up this event. Uh, it's, it's a really important thing to be doing. Okay, so my name's Kai Heron. As uh, John mentioned, I'm at Birkbeck at the moment. I'll shortly be moving over to Lancaster, and I'm also an associate at Commonwealth, uh, where I work on questions of ecology, commons, democratization, and green transitions generally defined. And when I was invited, I, I kind of had a, a quandary. I think about these issues in two ways. One is very macro, it's global. So I think about um, the threat of something like green imperialism or an extractivist regime for green transitions in the global north that will exploit the lands and labor of the global south. And I'm very attuned to that and you know, aware and conscious that that's a real threat. A previous UN special rapporteur for inequality said that we're heading towards a climate apartheid scenario. I think that's very true. So I could have pitched things at that level, but in the interest of doing policy, I've pitched it at a slightly different level. I'm gonna go quite modest and talk about uh, on the ground kind of policy making, organizing work that I've been doing for the last couple of years with colleagues. Uh, so I'm going to introduce something called a public common partnership that we've written a couple of reports about. And I'll explain what that is and why it might be useful in thinking about green transitions in the UK and hopefully beyond. Okay, so I'm gonna begin by explaining in abstract terms what a PCP, as I'm gonna call it, a public common partnership is and why they might offer an important alternative to either private or state ownership of and in our thinking about green transitions. And then I'm going to describe how PCPs might be used as a means of revitalizing council farms, which some of you might have heard of, but if not, I'll introduce you to what they are, as a pathway towards commoning agricultural systems in the UK to ease access to land for new entrants, to restore damaged ecosystems, and to assist in a green transition. Okay. So if I'm going to get through all of that in the 15 minutes that we have allotted each, um, it's a lot to get through. So I'm going to take a couple of things for granted, things that I think the first two at least everyone's going to agree with. The first, ecological crisis is here, it's now, and it's completely irreversible. Someone said earlier we're heading towards an irreversible situation. We're already there. It is irreversible. The 1.5 people say is on life support. Depends where you sit on that scenario. We're in that arguably is, is gone. That doesn't mean we don't act. It means we're more obligated to act than ever before, right? So it's both too late and we have to act now. I think we all pretty much agree on this point, right? Um, in 2018, a special report from the IPCC said that we need rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in land, energy, industry, buildings, transport, and cities. And that urgency has only escalated since that report came out. So that's the first assumption. Climate change is real, it's happening, and it's irreversible. The second is that a transformation of the scale that we need to have delivered 
will not be delivered by the private sector, which as the slogan goes, and as somebody said earlier as well, puts profits before people and planet. So we can't rely on the private sector to fix this issue. Then the third assumption, neither is it reasonable to expect a transition to be delivered in a top-down manner by the state. So someone was talking about social movements and social organizing. I'm gonna try and thread a needle between social movements and policy, if I can, in the time that I have. So nationalization is great of key industries, but it's not enough. A large-scale rapid transition of the kind that we need requires the consent, mobilization, and empowerment of communities across the country. This isn't a new insight of mine. I'm not you know, coming out of this revolutionary new idea. In 2017, under Corbyn's leadership, the Labour Party published a report, I believe it was commissioned by John and Rebecca Long-Bailey, called Alternative Forms of Ownership which proposed that neither private nor state ownership could deliver social, economic, and ecological justice. It, the report basically argued that alternative forms of ownership were needed in which the state would work with communities to develop new democratic systems of ownership, self-management, and of economic planning. And then this idea, again, is not new from 2017. It goes even further back, so I'm gonna reference one of my favorite thinkers on these issues, Stuart Hall. He had an essay in 1984 called The State Socialism's Old Caretaker, in which he said that he makes a plea for passing power from the state to society at large. So he says, we can envisage a partnership between the state and society so long as the initiative is always passing to society, so long as the monopoly over the management of social life does not come to a dead halt with the state elite so long as the state itself is rooted in, constantly draws energy from, and is pushed actively by popular forces. So the public common partnerships I want to discuss are guided by that intuition that common ownership is not just state ownership, that democratization is not just a political goal, but a social and economic goal, and that power over the most urgent socio-ecological questions of our day and over the reproduction of society at large should be passed from the state to popular forces of all kinds. Crucially, that agenda isn't just a politically motivated wish, something it would be nice to have. It's a socio-ecological necessity. So again, to have a green transition of any kind, we need the consent and mobilization and empowerment of communities. And so the PCP model is trying to do that. Okay, so the goal that in the time that I have left is to, as I said, thread that needle between Stuart Hall's words and this report on forms of alternative ownership. Uh, and I'm going to focus on agriculture, which we haven't, dis it's briefly been discussed, but it's not been discussed enough, I think, uh, in this space so far. So the sector uh, occupies 70% of UK land. We are largely an agricultural territory, though we may not think like that. Uh, and while it's only responsible for 10% of emissions, at least at the point of production in agriculture, Agriculture is responsible for 69% of nitrous oxide emissions and 48% of methane emissions, which is a highly potent uh, carbon um, gas. Okay, it's also responsible um, for, it uses fossil fuel-derived inputs, such as fertilizers and pesticides. It's responsible largely for the disappearance of half of the UK's biodiversity since the 1970s, for soil erosion, and for the pollution of our waterways. And we have some of the most polluted waterways in Europe. So with all of that set up, I'm going to get into properly into the kind of policy wonk material of what a PCP is. Please, please bear with me. It's not my natural territory, but um, I think it's worth going there. So public, pu pu uh, pu public common partnerships, rather, are an institutional form to democratize the management and ownership of an asset or a resource. It can be anything from a farm, which I'll be focusing on, to a woodland, to an energy company, to a high street, or to a hospital. PCPs, as our reports for Commonwealth have shown, and our ongoing work with communities is showing, are a viable alternative to private ownership as a means of empowering communities to decide and act democratically on economic, social, and ecological issues. So as the name suggests, PCPs are a subversion of the failed model of public-private partnerships that were pursued by successive British governments and in which public money, land, or assets were given to private for-profit corporations to provide public goods and services. So you might want to think, for example, of the kind of back-end privatization of the, the NHS, which if you take a, a broad notion of a PPP, I think this applies. The 2018 Carillion fiasco, if people can go back post, you know, pre-COVID, 
that was a public-private partnership as well. So over the years, they've been incredibly successful at redistributing wealth and resources from the state to private capital. Capital benefits massively from this investment, and the risk is taken by the state. That's the largely what's, the, what's in it for private capital. It's a kind of de-risking of their, their um, financialization, expansion, and accumulation of wealth. So PCPs, public common partnerships, propose that rather than partnering with private capital, councils and other public bodies can and should work with communities to design, manage, and expand the commons. So rather than using public money to support private capital accumulation, we propose that public funds and resources are used to empower communities, giving them collective democratic control over assets and resources. So what does that look like in practice? PCPs entails the co-ownership and co-management of an asset or an industry or a service by three distinct and mutually supporting groups. So the first is a relevant state authority, such as a council or another landowning public body, and that's the public part of a public common partnership. The second is a grouping that we've taken to calling a commons association, which is comprised of community members, residents, local business owners, it might be unions, workers, consumers, this is part of the commons. And then the third is public, uh, project specific stakeholders or specialists. Again, that might include union representatives, it might involve conservation ecologists, landscape architects, and so on. And this is also part of the commons because it entails the free exchange of knowledge and expertise to get these things off the ground. So from the perspective of public authorities, this governance model helps to mitigate political risk. This is why you might want to get involved in this. While addressing democratic deficits and reducing economic costs by enabling mutually supportive exchanges of finance, knowledge, and practice between various PCP members. So it's much less politically dangerous, for instance, to pursue a conservation project or an urban development plan or renewable energy project, for that matter, with the support of the community than against it. And a PCP can help affiliate and help that work. From the perspective of the Commons Association to the communities, the model gives them access to finance and it facilitates collective ownership and control. So I'm almost done with the kind of technical details of this. I, I promise we'll get through this. Um, so the novelty of PCPs, why PCPs matter, is that they can set in motion what we call a self-expanding circuit of the Commons to contest the self-expanding circuits of private capital accumulation. So revenue and practical knowledge that's accrued from one PCP can be used to seed new PCPs elsewhere in a virtuous circle of commoning and democratic governance. So profits from a community-owned farm, for example, could be used to support the establishment of another community farm elsewhere, or the funds could be used to establish a community-owned renewable energy company which could in turn reduce energy costs for the farm and surrounding communities. So by serving as conduits for commoning, as I'm gonna put it, PCPs can do two things. First, they help public bodies and communities to bypass the disciplinary effects of private finance, which often just won't invest in public you know, community-led initiatives. Uh, and that also that can hinder democratic and sustainable visions of the future. And then second, their very existence kind of gives the lie to the idea that only private investors and state bodies have the skills, power, or knowledge to develop rural landscapes or urban environments. So PCPs show that communities working through common institutions can and should be the ones leading the drive to decarbonization and regenerative food production. All right, so I'm going to show what it looks like in practice. So, so far, my colleagues and I have been working on urban, with urban communities to develop PCPs. Um, that give them kind of control over their high street development and planning. So we've been working with a diaspora Latin American community in Haringey, in London of course, to resist private urban development projects that would see to the closure of an important market and community hub in the area. In a new cycle of work though, we're turning to questions of rural land and agriculture and the environment. So we're working, for example, with communities and an organization called Climavor on the Isle of Skye to design a PCP around commonly owned aqua ecological food systems on the foreshore. The idea there is to create jobs for the area and to restore damaged ecosystems in a way that can challenge the dominance of industrialized salmon farming, which is a primary employer on the Isle of Skye. So, and in a report I'm working on for Commonwealth at the moment, I propose that public common partnerships could make a modest contribution, and it is a modest contribution, 
to transformations of ownership and growing systems in England with a view to achieving food sovereignty, land justice, and a genuine green transition through agroecological farming. So to make that argument, we, ter we turned to our work in Scotland and to the potential of council farms in England as an agroecological space of transition for our food systems. So some of you may be aware of council farms, but if not, I'm just going to quickly establish what they are. Um, they're small to medium-sized farm holdings owned by local authorities. They were established in the late 1800s with the aim of easing access to land for young and first-time farmers. Councils lease the land, usually below market rates, with the expectation that tenants will acquire the skills and capital to move on to private farms in the future. In principle, they should be a vital first step to help people get into farming, and they could help address unequal land access among traditionally excluded groups, the working class, racialized communities, women, and so on. But in recent years, local authorities have taken to selling off council farms to plug spending deficits or support struggling social services. So as land prices have increased, council budgets have declined, which makes it increasingly tempting to sell off your land assets as fast as you can to plug those deficits. Right, so as a result of that, between 1977 and 2017, 50% of council farms across England were, were just sold off to try and plug these deficits. Yeah. So not only does this make farming less accessible, obviously, as a profession for the majority, but it also shuts down opportunities to experiment with different systems of farming and producing our food, such as agroecology. This is essential because, again, as many of you will know, a third of all greenhouse emissions globally originate in food. And as I mentioned previously, uh, conventional farming operations are a primary mechanism for the de degradation of the nat natural world in the UK. Um, the recently, some of you may be following this, but there's a new policy report, a new kind of um, subsidy system that's just been launched by the Conservative government called e Environment Land Management Schemes, or ELMS. And while it's welcome, it's trying to kind of address these problems of conventional farming, it doesn't go far enough in reimagining who produces our food and where that food is produced. So 70% of the UK is agricultural land, but we import around half of our food, and much of what we eat is tended, picked, packaged, or transported by super-exploited seasonal labor, both in the UK, you'll remember shipping in Bulgarians to pick our food during the pandemic, but also in these highly intensive industrialized spaces in Spain, the Netherlands, and increasingly post-Brexit in Morocco, where labor conditions are simply abysmal. So this doesn't go far enough to address that, and it doesn't go far enough, this, this ELM scheme, um, to, to kind of think about the potential for farming and land management systems to contribute to boosting biodiversity, restoring degraded ecosystems, and addressing the climate crisis. In contrast, agroecology as a farming system is climate resilient, which we're going to need increasingly in a warming world. It increases biodiversity, it sequesters carbon, and in numerous studies it's been shown to match conventional agricultural yields. What agroecology cannot match are the private profits that the current existing conventional farming system makes through proprietary seeds and off-farm inputs such as feed, fertilizer, pesticides, antibiotics, and fuel. Okay, so county farms and other public land holdings hold considerable promise to reverse these socially and ecologically damaging practices if managed as an agroecological PCP. So here, the idea is, rather than selling the land for a quick financial boost, councils could consider pursuing a PCP with interested groups and collectives, turning these council farms into spaces of best practice for future agroecological farming systems. And this would have four primary benefits, and then I'll give you some conclusions. So the four benefits. It would ease access to land for traditionally excluded communities, by letting them lease land at rates below market value, which is important with land values are just going through the roof in the UK at the moment. Two, it could support experimentation with more labor intensive, to refer to Anne's point, low off farm input farming systems such as agroecology. This could bring more production onshore. It alleviates pressure on the lands and labor of the global south, and it provides secure employment in the UK, all while addressing the climate crisis. And then third, it could provide a reliable revenue stream for struggling local authorities instead of the short-term fix of selling off their land. And then finally, council farm PCPs can share knowledge 
and surpluses to seed and support new PCPs. It doesn't just have to be farms. As I said, you can use that to um, seed capital, for example, for a renewable energy company. Okay, so to wrap up, it's important to say PCPs are an extremely modest intervention into something. We need a dramatic transformation of society. But it is a modest contribution. I think it's something worth considering in these spaces. But they're also not a quick fix for those who pursue them. They're not a kind of abstract model that we just go to a community and apply. I've been working for years with the communities I work with to develop these on the basis of you know, who's in the council, who in the council will sympathize and help us do this, who maybe sits in the council who's skeptical that communities can develop for themselves. You really have to get to know the terrain of struggle that you're working with if you want to develop a PCP. So when they work best, it's because people come to us having kind of understood that or they're interested in this model, knowing that it's you know, going to help them fit budgetary deficits, for example, or empower the community to develop against private development projects. Okay, so in any case, uh, I hope the forthcoming report can contribute in some kind of small way to this space on green transitions. And I look forward to talking more about it with the rest of you. Thank you. Matthew, I was going to bring you in on this because I know on the public services you've got an extra train on you. Yeah. Because this relates to the role of local authorities in community wealth building, same principle. Do you want to comment on that? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Matthew Brown. I'm leader of Preston City Council. I work... Uh, I work for the Democracy Collaborative. Good to see everyone. I'm a bit short-sighted at the moment. I've got a bit of post-COVID stuff, so everyone's a bit blurry, but I can still speak, thankfully. Uh, no, brilliant presentation. Brilliant day, John. Uh, amazing work. Um, I just think this fits in very much with the community wealth-building movement, which did, obviously, in this country begin in Preston, but also it came uh, from the alternative economies of Spain and spread to America. And I think... In terms of climate justice, looking at ownership models and community-based models, that's got to be the way forward, really, how we actually do it. And, you know, we've really got, got to get into communities. It'll be quite interested in the panel's thoughts about how we actually wake people up to the fact there are alternatives out there. They have done in Emilia Romana. They've done it in Mondragon. There are economic alternatives. We're seeing bits of it with community energy, community land trusts, other forms of democratic ownership like employee and worker ownership, unions getting behind community wealth building now. But this is really pressing. I'm just wondering, in a reality where we've got the most centralised government in the, the former European Union, uh, obviously we've got a very neoliberal mindset and have had for 40 years, how we actually do that and to actually tackle this agenda, really. So that's it for me. Cheers. Thank you. Um, just before I tell you who I am, I'd like to um, greet you in uh, a few words. Nondri, namaste, and uh, uh, inui putanda. And before I tell you who I am, there are three people who are not in the room today, and I honour their contributions. They are Schlacker. Does anybody here know Schlacker? from Cinema Action. Uh, Elena Rushbrook, who was a member of the Cooperative Party in Bromley when I was the chair of the Cooperative Party in Bromley. And uh, finally, th these, these deaths have happened in the last month. Uh, my fellow Quaker, Paul Rainey. So I'm John Courtnidge, Dr. John Courtnidge. Uh, my PhD is in chemistry from UCL, so the mention of various aspects of this uh, are something that I can not only talk about, but I demonstrate on Facebook. So my question is, would the members of the panel 
like a copy of the postcard that we hand out in the Bromley and Chislehurst constituency. Equally, in the, in the sense of equality, I turn to my fellow conferees and ask them if they would like one of these. Mary Fee has some there, and if Victor Logan is in the room yet, he was at other events, he has them too. Because we propose the abolition of ownership. There's been a lot of talk about ownership, and we propose that it should be replaced by the concept of cooperative careship. So when the last speaker spoke about selling off county farms, and I've owned a small holding, it was our cooperative society in Manchester that sold our farms first. And I tell you, as a South East London boy, I could use some words that would have me slung out of the room straight away. So that would abolish rent, it would abolish interest, it would abolish profits to shareholders. And my final question to my beloved friend John McDonnell is which member of the House of Lords does he think could sponsor our plan to make sure that no one has too little and no one has too much? Because we, that's our process. Our process is democratic and cooperative socialism. So there are the two questions. If you want one of these, Mary, <laughs> me, Thanks. whatever, uh, and then a specific question to John if he has any ideas about who in that other place is a reliable person <laughs> to contact. Thanks, John. Uh, pick up your postcards with him. Come in. Can you help him with it? Uh, thank, thanks, Joe. My colleague Joe sorting me out as usual. Um, Jerome from Debt Justice, formerly Jubilee Debt Campaign, the successor organisation to the Jubilee 2000 campaign that Anne was uh, played such a uh, leading role in um, two decades ago. <coughs> the um, debt crisis in the global south is now reaching comparable levels of payments out, um, to before the, that achievement. Um, the um, the di one difference is that, uh, that uh, it's now inseparable from the climate crisis. So um, the floods in Pakistan, for example, Pakistan taking on costs of tens of billions of dollars to pay for the, um, the climate in emissions of um, us and the, the rich countries and having it austerity and policies imposed by the uh, IMF. So... Um, and I think the other, the other par difference to two decades ago being the role of private creditors, very um, constantly with your discussion, that now 40% of the debts are owed to banks, hedge funds, um, bond traders who are making large profits from this. G20 response has been designed around not coercing the, the private creditors to take hits. Um, there's a huge need to um, force the the profiteers to come to the table, um, council debts. We're looking at proposals for legislation in the UK where many of the bond um, contracts are held. So I wonder if uh, Anne's thoughts on what, what steps we can be taking to bring, bring private creditors to the table to, to council debts. Thank you. Can I bring the panel in now? There's a couple of people indicated. I'll try them bring in later on in the next session, yeah? Hi. Can I? Yep. Is, is that, yeah, okay, good. Um, Great to hear from the Preston model. It's a really inspiring uh, model that people should pay attention to if they haven't already. And I guess that begins to answer the question. My, my glib answer to how do we spread the word about these things is having events like this and talking about them. I think this is a start, but this comes out of movements, isn't it? It comes out of people having these conversations on the ground. Uh, people are learning, I think, or relearning maybe, um, we've spoken about this post-2019 moment where we're trying to rebuild our confidence and our power on the left. But I think people are learning to, that they do have power, they can make change on the ground, right? And that, I mean, I really like this phrase from C.L.R. James, every cook can govern. It's the idea that anybody can be a governor, a democratic controller is possible. 
but we have to relearn that, right? Democracy is not, it's not ticking a box in an electoral booth. It's a practice every day. You, you, you practice democracy. Um, we have to learn that we can do that and we can establish those spaces. And that's one thing that PCPs try to do. But I think community wealth building is part of that conversation, the same conversation about how we do that. Um, so, yeah, let's keep, keep having that conversation. It'll be good. Um, yeah, two things. One, uh, I'm... Uh, been appointed by the SNP to the Scottish Just Transition Commission. They're the first government to actually appoint a Just Transition Commission, and that's wonderful. So as part of that, we went to the Outer Hebrides, where there's a community wind farm. And I'm just telling you the story in order to um, just bolster my point, uh, really, which is that, you know, and this community wind farm generates wind and pay and gets paid the going price for that energy. And because that's, a t that's linked to the gas price, over the last year the going price has been huge and they made massive profits, really. But down on the ground surrounding them, there's a great deal of unease and, and, and dissatisfaction with the community wind farm because ordinary uh, people on uh, the Isle of Lewis are paying global prices for their energy, and they're living in the shadow of free energy. And so, you know, this just my point about this community thing has to be, the, the global thing has to be tied in as well as the community thing. But I just want to say how much I enjoyed Kai's presentation and how right he is. Um, on this question of the debt, I mean, here we go again, really. Uh, and one of the things we tried to do at the Jubilee 2000 was to form a cabal of debtors. And really, that's what we have to do. We have to get the South to gang up together in the way that the creditors of the North have a cartel. You know, we need a, a Southern cartel. Now, that was very hard to do back in the 80s and the 90s because... Um, Peru, for example, had defaulted and was massively punished for that default, and, and debtor countries were terrified of, of that. But, I mean, it comes back to the old story, and the reason we got bankruptcy law was because debtors, mainly rich debtors, came together to say to the creditors, if you don't give us, if you don't release us from this debt, then uh, you're going to be in deep trouble. And, and, mm. and we, we developed an insolvency framework. We don't have that. And I would really urge campaigners to go back to arguing for a framework of justice for resolving crises between creditors and debtors. But I don't have an easy answer. I was learning about Pakistan the other day, and the huge tragedy is that uh, people are starving. There's not enough food. They have stopped you know, building storage facilities for grain because, after all, there's a global market and the, and the invisible hand is going to deliver this stuff. But secondly, there was grain, there were shiploads of grain in the ports of Pakistan. And because Pakistan didn't have dollar bills, they couldn't empty the ships of grain. And God knows what was going to happen to that grain. So, you know, the old finan international financial system comes and clobbers us wherever they can. But I wish you all the best with your work. It's so important. Thanks. On, on John's question, um, the person in the House of Lords, well, we've got a red cell in the House of Lords at the moment. <laughs> uh, one of them is sitting in front of you, Bryn Davis. But the person who is really leading on the elements around public ownership and cooperation and public finance is Prem Seeker. He was here early, but he's had to go off to a family and do. We'll, have to, we'll, connect, we'll connect with Prem. Um, these poor people, we persuaded them to go in the House of Lords uh, because a Labour government was coming that would eventually abolish the House of Lords. <laughs> but they've formed a red cell and much more effective than any other form of opposition outside the House of, Houses of Parliament at the moment, as far as I can see. Can I thank you. Can I thank you, Anne and Clive. Thank you so much. <laughs>